Hey there, everybody. I think we are good to start. So I'm going to make um, a start on this session. Um, so first of all, uh, welcome and thank you for joining me for today's session. My name is Emmanuel. I'm the founder and director of Lighthouse. Uh, Lighthouse is an organisation committed to improving outcomes for children in care in England. And our vision is for children in care to have the same opportunities as everyone else, because all too often they don't. In a moment, I'm going to show you what that means in practice. Um, so we hope we hope to achieve our vision by setting up children's homes based on learning that I did in Europe back in 2017 and 2018. So in today's session, I'm going to be speaking a bit more about why I set up Lighthouse, how we were introduced to social pedagogy, what I learned from colleagues in Europe and how we're incorporating social pedagogy into our children's homes. Um, at the end, there's going to be plenty of time for questions, so feel free to just uh, drop them in the chat and we'll do as many of them as we possibly can. So in England, uh, there are about 75,000 children in care. Uh, most children in care live with foster parents, so in families. But for about, about 8,000 children or so, they live in a children's home. And the reason why they live in a children's home is, so bear me a moment. Apologies, got messages coming up. Um, but for about 8,000 children or so, they live in children's homes. And this is often because they have additional needs that need to be met by professionals. Um, so children who end up in children's homes have usually had multiple failed foster placements. And local authorities often view children's homes as being um, the choice of last resort once all other choices have been exhausted. So in 2014, I was working as a teacher. I was teaching two children who were looked after by foster parents. Uh, and at the time, I didn't know much about the outcomes of children in care, but it was quite apparent to me that their attainment didn't quite meet, meet their ability, um, match their ability. And it wasn't until later that I discovered that they were looked after children. Um, so I started reading more about the experiences of looked after the children. And the more I read, the more concerned I became that, about the fact that these children were often at much, much higher risk of poor educational outcomes, of homelessness, of ending up unemployed as an adult, of having quite serious mental health difficulties and also ending up in prison. It's also clear that the 8,000 children who end up in children's homes were also at even higher risk than um, children in care overall. So on the slide, you'll see that there are a number of headline statistics, which I think really highlight the challenge that looks after children are facing. Um, now, the first statistic is the fact that only 4% um, of children in children's homes get good GCSEs. And this is compared to about 60% of non looked after children. So only a fraction of children who grow up in children's homes are getting the sort of expected educational um, attainment at school. And GCSEs are qualifications that you take when you're around about 16. 90% uh, of these children have a diagnosable mental health condition. Um, what's particularly concerning um, about that is it's compared to only about 10% uh, of all children. And lots of children's homes where these children are claim to be therapeutic and offer help with mental health. Um, but when you actually have a look at the mental health uh, provision that's available, it's not apparent that there's any support at all. Um, now, the last statistic is that 49% of young offenders are, are care experienced. Almost half of um, young people who get a criminal conviction have experienced care at some point. Uh, and we know that a massive disproportionate number of those children are children who grow up in children's homes, largely because children in children's homes um, are often criminalised when they are, are quite young. Um, now, these are all quite concerning. So back in 2017, with a group of former teachers, um, I founded Lighthouse. And we founded the organisation because we felt that more could be done to challenge these statistics by setting up excellent children's homes and working with the rest of the children's homes sector to ensure that these children have the same opportunities as everyone else. The other thing to note is that there is a huge cost to society as a result of failing to address the needs of looked after children. Now, on this slide, you can see um, what are the costs of each intervention that a child in a children's home may experience at different points of um, their life. Now, the progression across the line can be thought of as their journey 
to various state institutions that some of these children were experienced. Now, not all children will experience these, but far too many children experience most. Um, now, the first one is around uh, foster care. Um, now, um, about a third of children in children's homes have had more than six foster placements. So foster care is where these children usually start out, and that usually costs about £50,000 um, a year. Um, it's usually after a number of failed foster placements that these children end up in a children's home. Um, and pricing the children's home can be uh, as high as £500,000 uh, per year. And children typically spend about 1.5 to 3 years in a children's home. Now we know that about 40% of these children will be what is known as not in education, employment or training or meet. And the cost uh, to the state of this is about £56,000 um, per year. Um, and then, as we've seen before, lots of these children will end up in young offenders institution or prison. Um, now, about 49% of young offenders have spent time in care, and many of them having been in residential care. Um, and then we also know that a great deal of children leaving children's homes are homeless, about 48%, and that cost the state is about £30,000 um, a year. Um, and as we saw before, about 90% of these children have um, quite serious mental health conditions. Um, but the support for that drops off at the age of 16 and then they'll need to access mental health support elsewhere and the cost of the state of this is about £59,000 uh, a year. So when I was initially doing this research into children's homes, um, I was not initially intent to up a children's home, far from it. I had been a teacher, so I was thinking that I might set up a school or develop some interventions that can work in schools. However, the more that I read, the more I became interested in the experience of children and the more I realised that something needs to change and we need to do something different. So reading some of the literature in children's homes, I decided to spend some time volunteering in them to get a better understanding of what the issues and challenges were. And after doing this, I discovered that there were four main key issues which if addressed might lead to better outcomes for children and one of those issues is around turnover and training. Turnover in the children's home sector is alarmingly high um, and it varies depending on where you are so some children's homes have turnover about 20 percent a year so about 20 percent of their staff leaving but it goes all the way up to 80 percent. Now in London turnover is usually between 50 percent and 80 that means that every year more than half of the staff it work in the children's home are going to change and replaced by newer staff who don't necessarily have the experience or training necessary. Um, I also discovered that children's homes tend to be quite institutional. Um, this is despite typically there being about three or four children in a children's home and they're often in quite typical domestic residential environments but usually the design that goes on in the inside, the things that are put on the walls are more reminiscent of an office as opposed to a home where somebody's growing up. And then that gives them a real institutional feel. Um, also, education is far too often an afterthought, and um, the mental health support that children are supposed to receive can often be inadequate. Um, and then finally, there doesn't appear to be an evidence-based approach to supporting children in children's homes. We have lots of different uh, approaches across the country, but the amount of evidence um, that goes into them is very So after identifying these issues um, and doing this research with um, a group of teachers, um, we decided to have an alternative, we decided to um, explore alternative models to children's homes. Now we decided that we wanted to set up a children's home to improve outcomes for children, but we hadn't quite worked out what our approach is going to be. Now we knew a few things, um, so first of all we knew that people were going to be very important, that it was going to be and it's really important to be able to recruit, train and retain um, some really great people. And this was something that the sector was really lacking. Um, we knew that the places were going to be important, that we wanted to set up children's homes that felt a lot more like home, a lot less than institutions. Um, we also knew that the purpose behind what we were doing was going to be important and that we wanted a clear purpose built around education and also therapeutic support. Um, what was missing was an overarching evidence-based uh, approach. And then I came across social pedagogy. So when I was doing my reading around children's home, I read um, the book of Thomas Brunel, which is a book by uh, someone called Claire Cameron and Pat Petrie, um, working with children in care European perspectives. So what really struck me 
was how much better the outcomes for children in children's homes were in places like Germany Den Denmark. And the book goes into some details about children's homes in five different uh, countries. It talks about the training provided, the outcomes for children, and how they compare and contrast with one another. Um, and it goes into quite a lot of detail about how well-trained staff in children's homes are in countries like Germany and Denmark and uh, a couple of the others. And this is quite different to what we had in England. So I started to read more about how all staff were trained in social pedagogy and how relationships and education were very much central to the approach taken. Uh, so for those of you who are new to social pedagogy, I'm going to brief a bit more about what it is. Um, so um, some people describe social pedagogy as education in the broadest sense. As broadest sense. It takes a really broad approach to, to education, what it is, um, moving beyond just the classroom and into all the other opportunities to learn um, uh, outside of the classroom. Um, it's an approach that's widely used in Western Europe. In some countries, it's been around for about 40 years. Um, and it's a practice that draws on a number of different fields. It draws on um, education, sociology, psychology, and philosophy. philosophy. Um, in many European countries, social pedagogues, those who practice social pedagogy, work in a range of different settings. So some might work in early years, some might work with disadvantaged adult groups, and of course, some work in children's homes. Um, now, social pedagogical thinking is a way of thinking about both social care and education as one of the same thing, and it uses education to make responses to social issues. Now, there isn't a single way in social pedagogy, and it's quite different in different countries. I'm going to go into this a bit more uh, in a moment. But what makes social pedagogy uh, consistent is that there are common methods, approaches, and ways of working. Now, one approach used to defining social pedagogy is what's known as head, heart, and hands. And these are almost like the three uh, main sort of concepts within um, social pedagogy that allow social pedagogues to do their work. Um, now, around head, now these are theories and concepts that social pedagogues use, and these might draw on um, sociology, psychology, philosophy uh, to inform their practice. Um, there is an expectation um, practitioners are reflected uh, in what they do. Uh, and he also focused quite heavily on education and academic development, and not just for children, but for themselves as well. So social pedagogues are always trying to learn new things. There's also the heart aspect of social pedagogy, um, and this is about emotional and spiritual learning for one also the child as well. Um, it uh, uh, prioritises the personality of the individual and takes a really positive attitude um, to um, the various activities that social pedagogues might do with children. And then there's a hands approach, which is about practical physical skills. So social pedagogues prioritise doing practical activities with young people and having methods and creative activities as well. Um, so after reading about social pedagogy in 2019, I applied for what is known as the Winston Churchill Memorial um, Fellowship um, to visit children's homes in Germany and Denmark. Now the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust Fellowship provides funding for people to visit other countries and do research. And I read lots of the literature, but I really felt that I wanted to see social pedagogy and social pedagogues, pedagogues practicing um, with my own eyes. So in, in the next few, few slides, I'm going to speak about what I witnessed in um, each country, both uh, Germany and Denmark. So starting with um, Germany, um, I went out and spent about a month in Germany. Um, I was um, two homes there. Um, this was after the previous year visiting about six or seven times. So I went back in 2018 just to visit um, a, a couple. And I learned a number of interesting things there. So um, whilst um, lots of practitioners folk, um, practice social pedagogy, they're broadly split into two roles. So um, uh, you mostly get social pedagogues and educators. And social pedagogues um, are usually um, uh, slightly more qualified than educators. So to become an educator usually takes about three years. And, the equivalent, it can be viewed as the equivalent of getting a university university diploma, um, but social pedagogues have to go to university and train for five years. So they do three years bachelor's and then they do other um, placements in different settings as well. Um, like being a nurse or a doctor, um, it's a protected term, so you cannot call yourself a social pedagogue without the degree. Um, and it's quite competitive to get onto um, a social pedagogy degree. It is something that lots of people want to do and want to study. Uh, 
Um, so I just want to talk about a couple of the homes that I visited when I was out in uh, Germany. So the first one is R8 in Berlin, um, and that had about eight young people living in the children's home. Um, they were aged between 40 and 20, um, and that a bit older than what you would see in children's homes in uh, the UK. Usually children's homes have children up to the age of 16, and in some cases up to the age of 18. And the children in R8 have a range of behavioural issues. Um, a couple of notable things about RA, it's actually located at the top of an office building, um, which is something that you are highly, highly unlikely to get um, in the UK. And I, I thought that was an interesting um, challenge around its location. It's also right in the heart and it faces a number of the challenges that urban children's homes um, often face with and things like gang affiliation challenges of, um, in quite a, a built up urban environment. Um, one of the things that the home really did focus on was education, and it had really strong relationships with local schools and really encouraged children to, to do well, and actually the children tended to do quite well um, academically as well. Um, so it's a really interesting example of a home in an urban environment, and we took a lot of, um, from, I took a lot away from this, um, given that I was um, intent on setting up our first home in London. Um, and then after um, finishing my time at R8, I went up to um, a place in Germany called Schleswig-Holstein, um, which, um, and I visited a home called WG Syrup. Um, and WG Syrup um, has about 10 young people living in the home, um, and their ranges were 10 to 18, and it tended to be young people with a range of behavioural issues. Uh, what was notable about the home was that it was in a rural setting, so quite a contrast to uh, R8 and quite far away from um, everything else and that had brought some benefits to it, there's plenty of open space, lots of opportunities to go walk in the countryside but it also had challenges in terms of recruiting staff because it was quite remote and difficult to get to. Uh, one of the things that the home really focused on was on group dynamics so it saw being um, on the whole official to the children that were there and they were always encouraged to um, build relationships um, with and it was a really interesting experience there because I had the opportunity to stay on site. So I, I stayed in my own room for the period of time that I was there. And it really allowed me to um, embed myself in the home and learn a great deal about it. Uh, so after completing my time in Germany, I then went over to Denmark um, and uh, visited some children's homes over there and learned more about social pedagogy in that country. And the interesting thing about social pedagogy in Denmark is it's the qualification that I wrote professional take. So nursery teachers, youth workers, and kindergarten teachers are all social pedagogues in Denmark, as are the staff that work in social and residential care. And um, so in order to become a social pedagogue, you need to um, study a degree program which lasts for three and a half years in what is known as a seminary. Um, and they're also given a great degree of freedom and autonomy in their practice. They are very much viewed as being professionals and their professional judgment um, very, very um, important. And it's really interesting when you are sat with um, social workers and people from professionals who are supporting and looked after children because they do look um, to the pedagogues and their professional judgment in quite a serious way. Um, so the first home that I visited when I was in Denmark was called Josephine Schneider House. And um, Josephine Schneider House is quite interesting. It had 12 young people, so quite a lot and a really wide age range, which is um, age from 10 to 21, and this would be almost unheard of uh, in, the, in the UK. Um, and most of the children there tended to have some sort of mental health um, challenge. Um, a number of uh, notable aspects, one was education, the education literacy, and the children tended to do quite well in their education. I also had the opportunity to spend some time in um, one of the schools that the and children uh, attended and it was a really interesting opportunity to see the interaction between the home and the school and um, pedagogues at the end of the day did go to school and pick up the children and have a conversation with teachers in a way that um, isn't really very common in the UK. Um, it's really interesting uh, speaking to the staff um, because I had a conversation with a social pedagogue there who spoke about some of the challenges in um, having newer members of staff um, but they viewed a new member of staff as being someone who'd been there for three years or less um, in the UK that would make you a very long-standing member of staff. So um, on the whole, staff tended to stay for quite a long time and the longest serving member of staff had been there for 25 years. And um, the other thing that's interesting about Joseph's Island House was the length of stay for the children. 
um, children tended to be there um, very much from their early childhood right through to the age of 21 before moving on and, and they felt that that stability um, offered children a real opportunity to settle and grow and develop in a time at home. I'll say that Josephine Snyder House is probably one of the places that influenced our work uh, the most. Um, I, I was really fascinated by the group dynamics, the way of creating a family atmosphere, the way in which they um, use the local community to support uh, the home as well. And I and spent a, a lot of time um, observing that and incorporating that into our plan. Um, I visited the home on two separate occasions, 2017 and 2018. It's a really uh, good understanding of what um, they were doing. Um, and um, in, in, on the whole, I thought it was a really a great example of how social pedagogy can really. Um, so the last thing that I'm going to talk about is um, it also in Denmark as well, and it's a place uh, called Goodhown. Um, and Goodhown um, was quite an interesting place, quite distinct from lots of the other homes that I visited. And one of the reasons for going to Goodhown is that I wanted to go to a place which had some of the most challenging um, children. And Goodhown is a place that children usually uh, go to if they are unable to be in children's homes elsewhere uh, in Denmark. Um, now it has 43 young people, but I put technically in, bar in, in, in brackets because um, they're actually organised into groups of eight or nine living in different buildings across the same. Um, children are aged between seven and 19, but they're usually grouped around age ranges in the different um, buildings together. And it tends to have children with profound and multiple difficulties. Um, a couple of notable aspects about Good Town. It has its own on-site school. Um, so the picture in on the top, in the top right is a picture of the school um, and those children are taught in quite small classrooms um, together. So it almost has a little bit of a, of a, a boarding school. Um, there are quite real challenges to supporting those children. Um, lots of them have quite severe mental health difficulties, behavioural difficulties and at the same time are attending school on the site. So that presents a number of challenges. But they were dealt with um, you know, brilliantly by, by the staff that were there. And there's a real um, synergy between the school and the children's homes and their way to work and together. And so a few takeaways um, um, from Europe that we've incorporated into this work. Um, one is the role of the, social pedagogue, uh, of the social pedagogue and their ability to understand the needs of the individual and their family and they use their knowledge to help and the children to attain self-sufficiency. Um, social pedagogues are highly capable, they're well educated and they tend to come with a high status in the communities in which they work. Um, they seem to be very at what they do and um, they cover much of the work that social workers, teachers, charities and residential care workers do in the UK. Um, they're also independent of the state and they have the state to innovate and can be flexible in the work they do and overall the outcomes of children are much higher. So just a bit about Lighthouse and where we are now. Um, so after my research in Germany and Denmark, I came back to develop um, this new approach to running children's homes. Um, and uh, we like to call this approach the Lighthouse model. And it has four aspects that we refer to as people, place, purpose, and social pedagogy. Um, so with people, uh, what we want to do is recruit the very best people to work with vulnerable children. Um, so we are selecting people with the right competencies and with the right and background to be able to support the children in our children's homes. Um, the second piece is place. Um, so we want to create stable um, places for children to grow up in that look feel like a typical family home. Um, the third piece is purpose. We think there should be a really clear purpose for what we're doing and that should be built around education and therapeutic um, support as well. And we want children to be able to um, participate in this. And then the final piece, social pedagogy, um, are we witnessing it in, in use in Western Europe? And I really thought that social pedagogy provides an extra basis for supporting children who grow up in residential care. Um, so just a bit about um, our home. So we're in the process of developing our first and it's going to provide uh, accommodation support for um, young people aged 12 to 17. And so currently there's a desperate lack of children's homes in London and the South East. So we're opening our first home in London and we think this will enable um, more children in care to maintain relationships with friends and professionals in the local area. Because at the moment, lots of children in London are being sent to other parts of the country. 
Um, so we decided to purchase a derelict house and we're currently in the process of redeveloping it. Um, we've, um, we've learned in visiting children's homes in Germany and Denmark to inform the design. Once it's complete, it's going to set an entirely new standard for what children's homes can be uh, in the UK. Every element of the project has been very carefully considered and designed. Uh, we made sure that we are in close proximity to good schools and we've even thought about the materials that we use, which is to make sure that it maintains that family um, feel. And so we've worked really closely with architects to design the interior to create a, a, a warm, friendly feeling environment, which is guided by trauma-informed and perspective. And we hope that by creating a thoughtfully designed space, we can encourage a sense of safety, create opportunities for play and creativity, and, and share experiences with, with others. Um, so we're also going to be working very closely with local services like schools and social services to ensure that young people who live and get the individual support that they need to learn and can also just have fun um, as well. So we're a growing organisation, we have ambitions to expand and we're hoping to open a um, few more children's homes for the next year. Um, so how are we using social pedagogy at Nighthouse? Um, so we're using it in a number of ways at the moment. We're in the process of recruiting for our first um, frontline team of practitioners. Um, so we want to ensure that we're selecting people with the ability to form positive relationships with young people and become social pedagogy practitioners. Um, in terms of evaluation, we thought really um, carefully about ensuring that we have an evidence-based approach to what we're doing. So we're going to be doing an ongoing internal evaluation and also work with an external evaluator. And it means that we can constantly ensure that we're reflecting and learning from what we do. Um, in terms of training, it's apparent that social pedagogues in Western Europe are very well trained. So we're going to be training staff up to the degree level with ongoing social pedagogy training. Um, we think that autonomy is really important and where social pedagogues um, practice best, they're given a great degree of autonomy. Um, and uh, the final thing is um, prestige. Now, we think that we can increase the prestige of work in the children's home uh, in the UK by setting a new standard um, for what a children's home uh, can be. Um, so that brings me to the end of the presentation. Please do place your questions in the chat and I'll respond to as many of them uh, as I can. Um, so we have had um, somebody just um, put the comment in the chat um, just saying that this is very informative and seeing the difference in how children look, uh, are looked after and being in a home that can have a lasting effect on their life and has really opened their eyes. So thank you very much, Gail, um, for that comment. If anybody else has any questions, please do um, pop in the chat. We've got a bit more time. Um, I'll give um, people uh, a little bit of time to drop um, some questions in. Uh, okay, we don't seem to have any questions coming through, um, but what I'll just do is um, leave my details up. Um, so if you do have any questions, please just um, jump my email down and pop me an email and I'll be happy to um, respond to uh, any questions. But um, uh, for now, thank you very much for coming along and listening so patiently to, to what we're doing and do get in touch if you have any questions. Thank you.